それではこれより全体会合に Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to begin plenary session two, the new U.S.-China strategic rivalry and the international community. But first, uh, from the left, we have with us uh, Dr. Professor Ryosei Kokubun, who is the president of the National Defense Academy of Japan, uh, Professor Liu Lingfu of National Defense University of China, Professor Toshihiro Nakayama of Keio University. He's also senior researcher of JIIA. Mr. Yukio Okamoto, the senior research fellow of MIT. And Dr. Michael Pils Pil Pilsbury, rather, a senior fellow of Hudson Institute. And I'd like to hand over the microphone to Dr. Kokubun. Good afternoon. As was introduced, I'm a president of Japan Defense Academy, or National Defense Academy of Japan. On this occasion of celebrating 60th anniversary of JIIA under the leadership of Ambassador Sasaki, we have started discussion under the first Tokyo Global Dialogue. We are very much pleased to see that uh, we are celebrating in such a way at the opening of the dialogue. I have been in involved in JIIA for about uh, 40 years. The first time I was involved in JIIA project was around 1980. Ever since, I had a pleasure of attending or involved being involved in various meetings and conferences, as well as projects under the auspices of JIIA. Looking back, my involvement of JIIA, one thing that comes to my mind is what started in 1989. Uh, that is a project among Japan, USA, and China. Back then, was proposed by uh, then uh, President, the Ambassador of Matsunaga, after consulting uh, with uh, then Prime Minister Hashimoto. Uh, the, the idea came out to invite core members from three countries as well as uh, from other uh, area sectors to discuss issues related to Japan, China, and the United States. The Japanese side was led by Ambassador Matsunaga, and then uh, Mr. Tanaka, Mr. Yukeko Tanaka, and I were there as one of the youngest members. And from the United States, key member was uh, Dr. Ezra Vogel, Vogel, or Vogel. And from China, we had Dr. Yan, the president of uh, the Chinese Institute of International Affairs. I think uh, such a dialogue was conducted for five, six years. Also at the same time, around that time, it, it so happened that Japan-US strategic partnership started to develop and the, their, the how Japan could be involved in such a development was under discussion and then uh, as a result, uh, there were various trilateral uh, dialogues and projects. I personally uh, was involved in four projects, and therefore, at least there were five projects involving three countries. And looking back, I think that was a time when China started to emerge by opening up its market, and therefore, the question of how to uh, engage China and how to deal with China was a main topic. And the in principle engagement of China was a key word uh, that was based upon tacit agreement between Japan and the United States, at which such Japan, China, USA project started to emerge. And of course, in the course of discussion, from time to time, we were engaged in 
uh, debate or argument over politics and security involving China and between Japan and China, uh, historical issues. And the, eventually, we came to somewhat settle down because uh, China was heading toward market economy, and therefore, out of expectation or tacit expectation, I would say, or tacit agreement that eventually China would open up its economy and shift to market economy, thereby coming closer uh, to the Western uh, values and Western world. And yet, China strongly insisted on their the political philosophy. And therefore, uh, back then, we did not have the up we were not too optimistic that China would eventually transform into market economy. But uh, we thought that would be the way that eventually China would move forward, especially that was expectation held uh, between Japan and the United States. But then, nearly 30 or 20, 30 years passed. Today, this is where we are. And thus, to discuss uh, those issues as well as other issues, we have as uh, such uh, the most uh, qualified uh, experts. Did China betray us? Where China and the United States are moving forward? Is this the opening of new Cold War between China and the United States? Or is engagement over or not? And then, where Japan stands in the context, those are topics that I suggest for discussion here today. Due to a technical matter, the originally we intended to have simultaneous translation for Chinese, but I was told that uh, the linkage among Japanese, English, and Chinese were severed down. I don't. I expect that that will be the uh, symbolization of the relationship cut down among three parties. And therefore, we have with us Ms. Omori acting as a translator on the stage. And each ex uh, speaker has seven minutes. So first, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Min to tell us about uh, where China stands. And then that will be followed by Dr. Pillsbury. I'm sure you have read his book. He will speak for another seven minutes. Then after that, the Mr. Okamoto will speak for seven minutes. And last but not least, Professor Nakayama will speak. Uh, based upon their expertise, we expect to hear from them. After five minutes pass, I will ring a bell. So please be punctual. And then at the end of uh, panel discussion, I'd like to take questions from the floor. Now, without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Liu, please. So right now in the world, there is no world war or major war, but uh, we have already in this uh, uh, hall a, a battle of uh, uh, philosophies or uh, ideas. And what is best about this Tokyo Dialogue is that everyone can speak frankly without exaggerations or lies or we will not talk about things without substance. And you have China and the United States, which are in a relationship of competition right now. And this afternoon, I am representing China, and we also have a representative from the United States. And he is also a, a, a good friend and also a good rival.
and to my friend from the United States. I like him very much, and I think that he is as adorable as a giant panda, and I am so uh, 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 feel so affectionate toward my friend. And, however, the country, the United States, I don't like that country because all over the world they are like a tiger and they keep biting people. So, I love my American friends, but the country, I don't like that country. And right now, between China and the United States, we see an exhalation of conflict. But uh, with my friend, Professor Pillsbury, I would like to enhance cooperation. And Professor Pillsbury, I would want to write a book with you, and the title of the book will be China's Dream Will Be Challenging the American Dream 30 Years Later, Who Will Be the Victor, China or the United States? And in January next year, Professor Pillsbury is coming to China, I hear. And so I hope to dine with him, and I hope he can enjoy Chinese food and drinks, and we can talk about this book. Uh, about uh, 30 years from now, between U.S. and China, uh, as a result of the great competition, there will be uh, three new worlds that will be established. And I said three worlds, three new worlds, and the first new world will be, uh, the first new world was the world created by UK, uh, the colonial world. Second new world, was the world that uh, was created by the United States. It's uh, hegemonistic. And the third new world, what kind of world would that be? China, Japan, India will cooperate, and there will be a new uh, world for mankind as a whole. And if we think about the last 500 years, there were three great ages. One is the age of Europe, the second is the age of Americas, and third is the age of Asia. Right now, when we talk about the Chinese dream, or there's a Japanese dream or an American dream, and we also should speak about the Asian dream. The global dream, the dream of the world, must also be taken up, but uh, I think that we need to create a global community sharing a common destiny. In the next 30 years, what is the in innovative uh, thinking? Not America first, not Japan first, not China first. It will be mankind first and the earth first.
So the relationship between China and the United States, when we think about it, what kind of role do we want Japan to play? Japan has, should not have a military alliance with the US or not with the China, but rather on both sides of the Pacific, you have China and the US and Japan is in between and it should play the role of a bridge. China, well, it's been 70 years since its founding, and during that time, the United States has tried to encircle it and to try to suppress the development of China. And during these 70 years, what has the United States done to Japan? It was an, to make Japan anti-colonialistic, and China developed, and uh, uh, well, there has been a move to try to control uh, Japan. Uh, China has developed, and Japan should become independent. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I was all, almost overwhelmed. And in fact, uh, thank you for being punctual. The, it was a little bit short of seven minutes. I'd like to hand over the microphone to uh, Professor Pillsbury. Uh, the first thing I want to do is advertise the book, The China Dream by Liu Mingfu. Uh, seven minutes just now was not enough for retired Colonel Liu Mingfu to present all his ideas. So I recommend you buy this book. It's available in English. I think it's in Japanese. Uh, it should be. Uh, <coughs> because this book is so good, many people, including me, thought Colonel Liu Mingfu would be arrested in China, and he'd be in the Xinjiang education camps today. <laughs> Let me tell you a few of the secrets he reveals in this book. Number one, he says China should be the leading country in the world. At the time this book came out, most Chinese officials were denying having any such ambition. So this book was the first to make this point openly. Everybody in China tells me, including taxi drivers, President Xi Jinping read this book and he got the idea of the China dream in his speeches and in other, there's other ideas in this book that President Xi Jinping uh, accepted and put forward. So that maybe protects him from going to jail in the Xinjiang education camp <coughs> that President Xi accepted so much of the book. The third thing he does in the book, for me it's the best part, he explains why America should not try to contain or slow down China, why America should accept the idea of being replaced in the world. And his idea is complex. He says America, like Holland and Britain and the many sp Spain, uh, <coughs> many Western powers, when they become the number one power in the world, they use uh, I immoral means, they dominate, they create colonies, they steal things. This is not the way China will be when China is the leader of the world. And then he explains in great detail how the Cold War with the Soviet Union will not work against China. So his book gives really good strategic advice to America about how to let China take over the world. I think many Americans learn from his suggestions. But he does reveal that in the next 30 years, 10 to 30 years before the Chinese takeover, China is willing to negotiate on many issues. And I think that's what's happening now. 
I think beginning with President Obama, especially in his last two years as president, continuing with President Trump, the United States has at least six important negotiations going on with China. These negotiations mean we do not have a relationship of enemy. We are not even rivals. We are in negotiations. We are fellow negotiators. Some of you may know a few of these. Maybe don't, you don't know all six. Obviously, the trade talks is the most covered. The trade talks is an important concession from China even to have the talks. Because what is the foundation? The foundation is the American allegation you have been stealing from America. You steal like intellectual property, you put pressure on our companies, you have to stop doing this or else. And the or else is not fully spelled out yet. It's at least tariffs. There could be other steps as well. China should have said no. We are not going to negotiate being a thief. We never steal things in China. Read American, read the China Dream by Liu Mingfu. But China came to the talks. There have been 13 rounds now. There's a lot of progress, 150 pages agreed to, a very complicated enforcement mechanism. The second negotiation going on is probably the least known. It's over nuclear weapons. Our Congress has passed a resolution that we should not agree to continue the current New START limits on nuclear weapons unless China is part of the agreement. China is willing to discuss what would be China's role in such an agreement. The third example of, and actually successful negotiations, China was willing in September 2017 to pass the UN Security Council resolution to put maximum pressure all around the world on North Korea. This was really a good thing. China did not have to do that. China could have continued its past, not full implementation of the sanctions on North Korea. A fourth negotiation has to do with Iran. Few people know China opposes Iran having nuclear weapons. China is in favor of the American effort. And China has its own idea about how to achieve this goal. We have another set of negotiations going on with China that concerns technology protection. It seems, and I describe this in great detail in my book, it seems the United States and the World Bank helped to create the Chinese economic model. The World Bank opened its largest office in Beijing. The largest loans went to China. China followed this advice, but somewhere along the way, China decided to conduct illegal behavior. But that's under negotiation also. You've all heard about the Huawei story. There are now a total of uh, 29 companies on the entity list. There are other US-China negotiations that have to do with investment, protection, there's an issue involving the nature of our Navy going into Chinese disputed territory. So far, the United States has followed the law of the sea, five points they're called, for innocent passage. In Chinese, I don't know if your interpreter knows it, it's called Wuhai Tongguo, innocent passage. It means when our Navy ships go into Chinese waters, they don't launch, here's the five things. They don't launch helicopters. They don't turn on their weapons radar. They don't maneuver in a circle. They allow the Chinese to accompany. It's not a secret surprise. So thus far, we challenge these Chinese claims in accordance with the dispute resolution uh, under the United Nations authority. Many other countries are joining the United States in this, but we are not doing this in a hostile way. So these negotiations also continue. So I, I oppose the idea that we're rivals or enemies. Uh, we're not military allies. And thanks to Colonel Liu Ming Fu's book, now Americans understand better what is China's long range goal. Thank you.
Pillsbury. Thank you very much, Professor Pillsbury. And uh, in considering time, I'd like to now ask uh, Mr. Okamoto. Thank you very much. Among the panelists, I'm probably feeling the most pessimistic and uh, international situation. I believe that uh, 30 years or so is one cycle. For example, World War One to World War, end of World War Two is about 30 years, and the Cold War also it's around that uh, amount of time. 64 Cuban crisis to the collapse of the Soviet Union is about 30 years. European expansion and integration, evolution, that process, Rome uh, Treaty to Brussels Treaty, Maastricht Treaty, again, that's about three decades or so. And then Middle East too, uh, from uh, Sadat's assassination to the Islamic uh, fundamentalists uh, crackdown continuing, and then uh, 30 years later, the Arab Spring. So it's not a law. It's probably just coincidence. But uh, well, uh, the war of time of war in Asia, uh, that is the Korean War and then Vietnam War ending in 75, uh, that's about 25, 26 years. So you have this uh, cycle of about uh, 30 years or so. And then you enter the next phase. That's how it appears to me. And China. Then Zhang Pin had the Southern Tour talks. And the socialist market economy was taken up. A black uh, cat, white cat, whatever catches the mouse is a good cat. And so the economy expanded in 91, 92 very rapidly, and then uh, three decades. So I think it's about now. What's happening now? According to IMF's estimates, China's economic growth rate is about to be about 5% and um, up until saturation, one cycle is about 30 years. And then for us, what we are most interested in is globalization. And again, 89 Berlin Wall collapsing. And then I think it's now 30 years later. And then uh, the borders were destroyed, the wall was destroyed, people, money, information, technology could now flow freely, and globalization was uh, rapidly progressed. But again, I am thinking that we are nearing this uh, end of the cycle. So with globalization, there is uh, international cooperation and uh, President Trump, uh, he became president in uh, 2017, and then uh, Mr. Xi Jinping uh, revised the Constitution, and he is going to be the president for life. Uh, that's also 2017, and uh, President Putin also became president eight in 2018, and I'm well, I don't think he will retire as according to the Constitution in 2024. So you have this kind of uh, dictator-like uh, people increasing. And then, uh, well, uh, I do agree with what uh, uh, was said about uh, Turkey and uh, Erdogan, President Erdogan and uh, Egypt and uh, MBS and Saudi Arabia, Hungary, Oman. So if you look around the world, you have uh, very authoritarian kinds of figures. And uh, uh, in great numbers, we see th them appearing in the world and actually moving the world. And so uh, globalization. I'm wondering if uh, it has uh, reached the end of the cycle too. So China, well, I think China will be experiencing another cycle of 30 years. So you have the Deng Xiaoping line of economic growth, which is uh, now uh, com being completed. But uh, I 
think that there's an inflection point here, and then it will be the next 30 years growing at uh, the unprecedented speed. It's not just economic growth, but uh, the substance uh, that is uh, science and technology will grow explosively, and uh, China is riding that wave, especially 5G and AI and quantum uh, science. So they are making uh, large investments in these areas, and this strategy is quite amazing. And the other day in Anhui, uh, uh, Anhui province, Anhui province, Hoe, there's a city called Hoe, and they have built a research institute. And this uh, uh, laboratory is uh, spending more than one trillion yen. And the total Japanese science and technology budget is almost equivalent to that. And that ha amount of money has been invested in constructing this national laboratory. And uh, as uh, according to uh, Monbiot Rial, um, there will be the world's strongest uh, nation appearing. And so I think uh, all the focus is now there. And then South China Sea is being encircled, and uh, now there are advances into the Pacific. So this is like the path followed by the uh, Japanese army in, uh, of old, uh, Solomon Kiribati Tuval. Uh, Tuval, uh, well, there can be some deep uh, sea uh, um, Ports, and so they tried to buy the lease of 75 years, and it didn't happen. And then uh, in 2049, the West Pacific uh, will be in its hands, and the uh, U.S. will be expelled from West Pacific, and uh, Taiwan would have been integrated by them. And uh, January 2nd, uh, Xi Jinping's uh, talk did not uh, exclude such a possibility. And uh, then you have uh, Republic of Korea, and there's not much time, so I'd like to take this up again later, but uh, Korea. Well, uh, conclusion, you have uh, three countries, uh, US, Japan, and ROK, but now they are leaning towards China and Russia, and they are trying to become a bridge to those countries. So that could be a very serious situation for Japan. That's my concern. Thank you for uh, being punctual. You mentioned about 30-year theory, 30-year cycle. Now uh, over to you, Professor Nakayama. My specialty is the United States, and therefore, from that point of view, uh, I'm looking at U.S.-Japan-China relationship. I hope I can make a contribution in a small way to this discussion here today. Well, the world is concerned about uh, the U.S. diplomacy and its commitment. And compared to other countries in Japan, that concern is uh, less intensified. And uh, therefore, the Trump administration is considered to be uh, relatively uh, they're, they're rated highly uh, compared to other countries. That is out of concern over emergence of China in Europe and in Middle East. The U.S. leaving those regions is a cause of major concern, and who would uh, feel that vacancy, uh, the vacuum? Uh, that's a major topic of discussion. But in East Asia, such a Plan D is not fully investigated in East Asia. In early December, in Washington D.C., Quincy Research Institute was uh, newly established. Joe Solis and uh, the, the Tea Party related organization is supporting uh, that institute, which is a bad news for American internationalism. But for this particular region, however, uh, the, it appears uh, that there is some expectation that uh, the, uh, the capacity left uh, as a result of uh, withdrawing from other regions by the United States may be allocated uh, to this region and therefore at least compared to uh, the rest of the world, Japan is less sensitive uh, to uh, the negative aspect of Trump administration. 
of course, uh, they would uh, increasingly call for a more burden uh, to be borne by Japan. Yet, I don't think there will be the consensus within the country in the United States that uh, the uh, United States uh, decide to uh, withdraw from uh, Western Pacific. And uh, the, on the part of Japan, Japan also has to increase its capacity. Uh, therefore, I believe there is a kind of sense of security and uh, expectation as well. As to Japan-US alliance, we hear a lot of noises, yet uh, the, there is no such concern that would also uh, be casted over uh, the, the alliance itself. So that's why Japan is different from other Western countries. And Japan is not critical of Trump administration, but rather I try to stand close to Trump administration, trying to adapt to uh, uh, President Trump. And it appears that that's a kind of realism embodied by uh, the prime minister as well as uh, the public in general. But of course, there is a kind of underlying concern over the emergence of uh, China. That may be the reason why Japan has shifted uh, to that direction. Now, in the United States, how they view emerging China, I think it is uh, changing drastically in the past few years. And uh, depending on how Japan would uh, the deal with that issue uh, in involving the United States, it may not result in negative uh, aspect to uh, Japan. Well, the, it appears that the U.S.-China policy and sometimes focus too much on business priority, and therefore uh, the Japan try to uh, voice its uh, their concern over such uh, direction. But now it appears that two countries are coming closer in terms of their uh, views toward China. Well, Professor Kokubu, or President Kokubu uh, mentioned earlier that uh, there was a time when Japan and United States expected that China would eventually join us, uh, join our camp. But then, even when we have to try uh, to strike a, a right balance between uh, the, uh, the hedge and uh, the engagement, it appears that uh, up until uh, before 2015, engagement was the underlying po uh, policy, expecting eventually China would come closer to a camp. However, that uh, was forced to change in the uh, the, the Obama administration, and since the, uh, the second half of uh, the, his uh, first term as well as the second term, the, it appeared that President Obama advocated the co-prosperity, coexistence, and then from uh, the first term to second term, he started to show some change in awareness toward China. And therefore, the, now that uh, the Trump administration uh, shows a harsh view toward China, and uh, I believe that dates back to the time uh, of the second term of uh, Obama administration. Of course, there are much differences in terms of China policy between Obama administration and Trump administration. But I would say that uh, the, although many state that it is because of uh, the uh, Trump administration that the such change started to emerge, actually, I would say that even under the third term, uh, of pre President Trump, uh, the Obama rather, or the President Clint Clinton, and for that matter, the I believe uh, they sh could have shown rather harsh view toward China. And then the question is, what kind of competition theory should be formulated? It appears that there are different views toward that in early July on Washington Post. Hundred of people signed uh, the, the criticism. The, uh, that was a joint statement criticizing a Trump administration China policy. I would say that was uh, the, the kind of uh, sending alarm toward a too hard-lined policy uh, by a Trump administration. So uh, the United States started uh, to be uh, increasingly hard-lined at the same time and they knew uh, the need for accommodation. That is because the regime change, that is, the changing the communist regime itself has to be changed uh, according to some radical uh, radicalism. 
And it appears that uh, the the U.S. administration is yet indecisive as to which way to go. Uh, therefore, rather than the single policy, I would say depending on departments of the government, they have different uh, the China policies, and such situation would continue for some time. Therefore, when we look at China policy by the United States, rather than trying to identify the single China policy, I would say that is a group of China policies held and promoted by different departments. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for keeping the time. And we will take the next half hour or so. And we will look at China, US, and then uh, Japan and divide the discussion in this way. Uh, first of all, uh, Professor Liu, you talked about uh, well, the China problem. And probably there is uh, uh, discussions, uh, various discussions taking place. That is, uh, China wants this uh, uh, mankind community sharing same destiny. And uh, you want to create that kind of a uh, uh, world. But uh, we don't know what the specifics of this view is. And our question, for example, if China's economic growth cannot be realized, then how will China itself create its dream going forward? And on that occasion, Professor Ryu, you are from the military. So the military spending and uh, the uh, social s uh, security spending, how will you make a balance? Because China is also going to have fewer children and become an aging society. What will be the balance? And in China, for example, you have the Hong Kong issue. And uh, well, Hong Kong issue alone will take up a lot of time. But if we could briefly hear your views and in the same way, Uyghur, and if you go to Umut, we hear that there are not much men, and so they are in the forced uh, labor camps, perhaps. And so, is this going to be a stable kind of situation? Well, let me talk first about Hong Kong. And, uh, well, uh, it's America behind the scenes. And the consul in Hong Kong has, uh, uh, U.S. Consul, uh, consulate has uh, several uh, thousand people and uh, special forces. And uh, Professor uh, Pillsbury, he was once in command of such front lines. So, the, in the Hong Kong uh, pro issue, you, we would want the U.S. to continue its uh, performance and the world will eventually know what the truth is. And in the next 30 years, uh, maybe China and U.S. will be in competition, but uh, we pray that it will not uh, ex develop into a war. And in the U.S. roadmap, I hope that uh, we won't find the words of uh, starting war. And uh, with uh, Professor Pillsbury, I think that uh, we have to have a marathon staking our lives. And then in 2049, I will be 98, and Professor Pillsbury will be 103. And uh, I look forward to the state of uh, China and the United States at that time.
2049. That will be Jaya's 90th anniversary. And also, in 20 years' time, we hope the three members can gather on this exact stage and we can see who the victor is, China or the United States. And what I hope for is in 2049, China will be winning, U.S. will be winning, Japan will win, and the entire world will be winning. And I'm hoping for multiple winners in the world. And as I said before, with my American friends, I wa um, want to write a book on cooperation uh, between the uh, U.S. and China and uh, with uh, Japanese youth. I have a, a book on the Japanese dream, and I hope that uh, we can also come up with the uh, book on the Asian dream uh, with the youth in Asia. I already purchased my airline ticket to be in Beijing <laughs> in 2049, but I still need a hotel reservation. I do think it's important we underline that when our China policy was set in America uh, 30 or 40 years ago, China was about 10% of our GDP, our economic strength. So our policy made sense in those days to help China grow, to hope for a strong China and a stable China. We also had wishful thinking about the political evolution in China toward democracy and that China would be a quasi ally of America because China helped us so much during the Cold War. China sold $2 billion of weapons to the CIA to help freedom fighters in Afghanistan and other places. China helped a lot in to drive the Vietnamese out of Cambodia in a joint program I talk about in my book involving seven other countries providing weapons and support to the Cambodian freedom fighters to kick the Vietnamese out. So China helped in many ways to win the Cold War against the Soviet Union. This is a uh, optimistic foundation for U.S.-China relations in the future. But today, China is 75 percent, some people say 80 percent of our GDP. So they will surpass us if they continue to grow three times faster and we cannot get our growth rate up above uh, 2 percent or so. This is a new world. This will be the new world in which China is at least even with us. So my book asks the question, should our policy of 30 years ago or 40 years ago continue? Henry Kissinger says yes. Henry Kissinger gave an interview just two weeks ago. I mention him because I know Japanese friends love Dr. Kissinger. Two weeks ago, he said in an interview, America must step aside and let China be the world leader. He's not the only American who thinks this. There are a lot of Americans who believe they are tired, worn out. They don't want to be world leader anymore. Let's give China a chance. I hear that a lot. Now, there's another group I call the Super Hawks. That would be Steve Bannon, Committee on Present Danger from China. They say Communist Party of China is so evil, it must be overthrown. So we have these two extreme points of view. I think in the middle is the idea that cooperation is important as long as we can succeed, issue by issue. That's why I mentioned the negotiations going on. Thank you. So uh, the way of thinking in the United States has just been introduced. And I would like to ask Professor Liu again. 
in the past, uh, well, there was too much spending on the military, and uh, there are examples uh, decades ago where empires fell, and uh, China, in s without the spending in civilian areas, it seems that uh, that uh, um, military spending without transparency is increasing. So, do you think that the country can well withhold th that kind of uh, spending, withstand that kind of spending? Today's world, it is not China, but the United States uh, that is a winner in military competition. Therefore. Eventually, it is not China, but the United States that will be worn out, and therefore they will uh, lose in military competition. So I'd like to turn to Professor Pillsbury. Let's set aside a dream of uh, China, a dream of the United States. Let's share a dream of Japan, Japan's dream. My best friend, I'd like to make a joint proposal with him. The proposal is as follows. On this occasion, I prepared the placard together with Professor Pillsbury. I'd like to give this uh, banner to uh, President Kokubu. Uh, this is uh, to express our support to the Japanese dream. I wanted to promote the support toward Japan's dream. Well, I will. I am not surprised at anything uh, whenever I'm working together with China. And I would say that uh, this is something rare that you would encounter at a symposium like this, yet, no solution was presented as an answer. I realize that we are running out of time, and therefore we'd like to turn to the United States. Professor Pillsbury earlier gave us a very clear explanation about different views that exist within the United States. So did Professor Nakayama, hedge and engagement, and the balance between the two. Now, talking about President Trump, it appears uh, to us that uh, he is too extraordinary, and uh, yet they would say it is clear uh, that given the uh, Vice President Pence uh, speech uh, the other day, the United States is increasingly hard-lined and getting tough toward China. Where are they heading toward? And in the case of President Trump, what it what uh, he has in his mind, is it just presidential election? Uh, if uh, Mr. Okamoto has any views to share with us. I'm sorry to surprise you, but to us, uh, the major threat does not come from North Korea. As long as there is the security treaty, uh, there will be retaliation by the United States, and therefore, even Kim Jong-un would not dare to uh, launch a missile towards Japan. Rather, the major threat comes from China. Because I'm not saying that China would directly attack Japan, but rather China would exercise its forces toward Taiwan. And then what kind of reaction the United States would take with a 50% of probability if United States rushed to Taiwan to support them, then due to security 
a treaty, uh, Japan is uh, responsible for supporting the United States. And then, uh, from China's point of view, whether Japan is standing in the forefront or in the back, uh, uh, back end uh, in supporting the United States, uh, the, there is no difference. And therefore, and then uh, the, uh, there will be no uh, prospect for uh, prosperity or peace of Japan. But rather, I would say, how can Japan tries to work on diplomatic front to convince China so that they would not resort to a such temptation. But that is not enough. In fact, uh, by further reinforcing the relationship between Japan and the United States, further reinforcing security treaty and alliance, uh, I think that is the only way that uh, is uh, viable. And in a sense, I think uh, there is a lot that Japan, should, Japan and the United States should do but not done yet. Well, a few days ago, uh, former Prime Minister Nakasone passed away. Remember that uh, there was a wrong yes a relationship. It was not just calling each other by first name. It was an alliance of the true sense of word. The United States was engaged in uh, negotiation with USSR about uh, intermediate range uh, their missile, and then uh, the United States informed Japan of uh, what kind of negotiation was taking place between two countries and as uh, they're asked uh, whether Japan could support or not. Such relationship did not exist ever since. For instance, in the case of President Clinton, when he talked with the other uh, Jen Zemin, the, when there was a major decision made about the, the removal of missile, uh, there was uh, the major celebration. There was a missile stored in the United States, but uh, he didn't. President Clinton did not. Uh, Clinton did not touch on missiles headed toward Japan. So even when uh, the beautiful words expressed of, about Japan-U.S. relationship or alliance, the whether those two countries are really in alliance in the true sense of word, I would, uh, I would like a question that. Compared to uh, President Obama, I would say under the Trump administration, the relationship is getting better because for President Obama, when uh, China constructed runways on seven islands in South China Sea, uh, President Obama did not take any action at all. If there were a strong intervention by the United States back then, the Xi Jinping would not have dared to construct seven runways. He might have stopped at first or second runways. And therefore, the question is, what should be done? And I say that uh, th there are a lot of homeworks to be done by Japan. Well, before discussing collective uh, the self-defense right, the, even within the, uh, the existing laws and regulations, there are a lot that Japan has not done yet. And therefore, toward Trump administration, the engagement with a concession is something that uh, we should continue to insist on. And at the same time, the Japan should perform its homework as well. Now, uh, over to you, uh, Professor Nakayama. What is your view on that? We have just heard from Mr. Okamoto about the uh, stance, uh, the soft need stance uh, by Obama administration toward China. But there is a lack of uh, the uh, idea on the part of trans administration, President Trump, that is uh, the under uh, the uh, ideal or the, the expected uh, circumstances, how uh, can we create multilateral uh, environment to make China less the aggressive? For instance, that could be TPP. And at the same time, uh, the Japan did not have enough courage to say no uh, to uh, such a stance, and therefore only partially responses were given by the United States toward China, and therefore on the part of Japan. The multilateral framework for the best China policy and strategy is something that Japan should continue to convince the United States of its importance. That's my impression. And earlier, the direction of China policy by United States, 
that's what President Kokubu referred to. I mentioned at the outset that for the time being, uh, the uh, different kinds of multiple China policies would continue to exist due to some structural issues. And some uh, draw an analogy to Cold War when we discuss relationship between U.S. and China, but that word does not fit well. That is because there are multiple contact points in the part of the United States, and so far the, the multiple contact points worked to our advantage, in other words, in restraining competition. That was the, the predominant view, but nowadays the, there seems to be a friction between different contact points. And therefore, it is not uh, because of multiple relationship that stability would increase. Rather, instability increases because of multiple relationship. So, the quality of competition on the contact points probably differ. So, sometimes they may be in contradiction, and you will find in the U.S. for the time being uh, many uh, policies toward China. Professor Pillsbury? So within the U.S. there is diverse Chinese policies, and so which will become mainstream going forward? And the Cold War between U.S. and China will not occur, do you think, or do you think that the possibility is increasing? I don't think a Cold War will happen between U.S. and China. I think somebody so far and I, maybe I'm the first, should praise President Ken Sase for his annual report, the first annual report of the summit. It has a long section on China. It's very well written. It has a section on arms control, new start, intermediate nuclear forces. So I don't know, Ken, if anybody else has praised this report. I thought it was excellent, and I hope you'll translate it into Chinese and give it to our Chinese friends. Our media has exaggerated the degree of uh, hostility in President Trump's China policy. He has had many phone calls, more than 30, with Xi Jinping. He's met with Xi Jinping in person. They have a very good understanding. They know they are engaged in multi-front negotiations. There's no doubt on the Chinese side they don't perceive a Cold War coming. The two speeches by Vice President Pence are friendly warnings to China. As many as 20 issues is in each speech. But the speeches open and close by calling for friendship and cooperation. If, <coughs> if I were Japanese, what I would fear about the U.S. and China is not a Cold War or rivalry. I would be afraid of a G2 a very close, intimate Chinese-American cooperation above G7, above G20, in which most major issues are worked out between U.S. and Japan, and U.S. and China, and Japan is not consulted. This would be my fear, because Japan is not a member of the U.N. Security Council. Many Americans, including me, wanted Japan to be a member of the U.N. Security Council. This is the key to being a national champion. China blocked this effort in a very ruthless, quiet way. There are a number of other things Japan could, I think, should do to become a great power. But one thing to be afraid of is something called the new model of great power relations. I don't know if the Professor Leo wants to mention this. He probably doesn't like it. The new model of great power relations put forward by China basically says the great powers, mainly the U.S. and China, will manage all world problems and consult with smaller countries only when needed. This would be a matter of great concern to other countries. So don't make the mistake of thinking about a Chinese-American Cold War or a hot war. Make, make your attention focus more on too much U.S.-China cooperation. Well, uh, the discussion is uh, now uh, touching many points. So what should be Japan's position here? Uh, there was 
some discussion about becoming a bridge. And then uh, there is a view that there should be the U.S.-Japan alliance being strengthened. And uh, President Xi Jinping, uh, well, his uh, visit to Japan might be realized. And so we see a tendency for improvement of Japanese-Chinese relations. That being the case, should uh, Japan uh, maintain this kind of position, or is there a possibility to take a stronger position? Mr. Okamoto, please. What I am concerned about right now, President Trump's personal direction, uh, it's not so much uh, what his direction is, and there is this uh, bedrock support of 42%, 43% or so of the president, and they have always been around. And uh, in uh, American domestic politics, uh, I think they are going to play a bigger role or have a bigger position. So even after Trump, this uh, bedrock group, this uh, hardline uh, isolationist type of group might uh, exert their influence. And according to a survey, 56% of Americans uh, in favor of reducing uh, military uh, troops in uh, this region. So in order to keep tie them to this uh, region, we have to do what we have to do. For example, uh, strategic uh, uh, s uh, nuclear subs cannot come to Japan. But actually, it, it should not be part of the non-nuclear principles because, uh, yes, you cannot bring it on land. But in terms of uh, transit or port calls, well, right now, non-nuclear principles, uh, the three are now uh, uh, treated like 3.5. And uh, well, I said the deterrence uh, by Japan and US is necessary towards China. And uh, these uh, nuclear subs, well, uh, you should not have uh, uh, port calls. But uh, if it's outside uh, the territorial waters and uh, well, right now, if even if there's a fire on such a sub, they cannot come into the uh, Japanese territorial waters, which was uh, decided in the 70s, and it's still uh, uh, around. So host nation support, yes, uh, we have to do that. And also, uh, bef even before we change or revise our constitution, uh, can we properly deploy the uh, defense force law? And uh, Prime Minister Abe, yes, uh, he's doing good things. Uh, and there, can he dispatch the self-defense forces? Uh, well, uh, U.S. should be able to feel that Japan is a true ally. I think that's most important. Professor Liu, so the U.S.-Japan alliance uh, what is the Chinese view towards this alliance right now? Uh, in the next uh, 30 years, I think that it, there will be a strategic opportunity for Japan in the US-China competition. After World War II, in from 45, uh, 70 years have passed, and the U.S. is having Japan under cooperative control and is binding Japan. Uh, for example, maybe. Uh, Japan should uh, free itself of such binds now. Right now in the world, there are three departures. One is UK departure from EU. Second is the US departure from the globe. And the third departure is uh, the uh, departure of many countries from the US.
and in the next 30 years, the biggest threat is not the Second Cold War, but the Third World War, uh, fears of World War III. Already, for 10 years, U.S. seems to try to promote a Cold War with China, but uh, we hope that that will not turn into a world war. If there is a war between U.S. and China, then I will not uh, uh, stay away from Professor Pillsbury. I will stay close to him. and. We are friends. There are uh, laws about uh, prisoners of war, so I'm not going to shoot him. <laughs> Professor Nakayama, uh, would you like to talk about Japan, about the alliance? I'm not exactly sure how to respond, but uh, in Japan, naturally, well, Japan has a situation it's facing, and in order to deal with that situation, it cannot do that alone. I think that's the consensus. And so all the options uh, need to be studied. But still, I think uh, the U.S.-Japan relationship is most important, and there is a strong consensus on that point. And uh, there is the short-term anxiety, and uh, should we continue to follow the U.S.? There are, of course, uh, wavering. Uh, well, uh, if uh, a certain administration takes a certain stance towards the Japan, there will be some fluctuation. But uh, for Japan, U.S. has always been a difficult uh, uh, existence, presence. And President Trump is uh, rather extraordinary, but he's on an extension of that line. and. Uh, there is this kind of a internalized realism. And uh, well, when we talk about realism, there is a lot of things that cannot be helped. And uh, well, I think that uh, that kind of feeling has become matured and uh, shared by the people. S and so I think uh, more than other countries, we have been able to absorb the Trump shock. And that is uh, uh, because uh, the US-Japan alliance is an indispensable option for Japan. And in the university, I uh, lecture on uh, U.S. Uh, relationship to uh, students who are about 20 years and uh, years old, and uh, uh, well, uh, they will be living about 80 years uh, still. And will the alliance continue? And uh, will it be continue to be the most important option for Japan? I cannot uh, give a clear answer on that, but for the time being. Uh, in order to deal with the situation Japan is facing, then we have to uh, emphasize the U.S.-Japan alliance. And of course, uh, yes, uh, for the people uh, too, I think uh, in general they feel the same way. Oh, so please uh, limit your comment in 30 seconds. And then after that, we'd like to take a question from the floor. Uh, Professor Liu, I have a question. What are you going to do with Taiwan? When it comes to Taiwan, I believe the United States showed a very good example and would like to follow that. About 100 years ago, within the United States, there was a civil war between South and North. That war lasted uh, four years and uh, 620,000 people were killed. What if China attacks Taiwan? It is just like the North attacked the South. Well, we'd like to follow the uh, same way that uh, the, the North did against the South, southern part of the United States. 
But I believe uh, the, the conflict would uh, be concluded uh, in a better way, the smart way. It will not take four years, nor it will not kill 620,000 people. And for unification, I believe the United States is a good example for us, and therefore, we'd like to continue to respect the United States and emulate what they have done. I believe you have eventually accustomed to uh, the way Professor Liu speaks, and now it is a good time to take questions from the floor. If you have any questions, first we will take questions. I see four hands, four people. Please state your name and affiliation. May I? Sorry, my name is Valérie Miquet. I work for the French uh, Res uh, Institute for Strategic Research, and uh, as well as for Japan Institute of International Affairs. I have a question for Colonel Liu and also to Professor uh, Okamoto. And um, I would like to know if, uh, Colonel Liu, if in your um, in your uh, China dream, there is any place for the EU, European Union. I, I might remind you that the EU is the first uh, economic partner of China today, and it might be very important uh, in this context of tensions with the uh, United States. And I would like to ask the same question to Professor Okamoto. Uh, do you think that uh, the EU, which is also sometimes too much of a soft power, can play any role in security uh, in the Asia-Pacific, particularly considering that interest in France for the free and open Indo-Pacific concept? Thank you. Hi, is my name. I'm from Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. I have a question. Uh, Professor Liu, and uh, there is a comment that I'd like to make before that. You have been so powerful. You're swinging your arm, and uh, you have been speaking so strong. That may be uh, the typical of uh, the, the the military, uh, the, the general or officer. It may be quite useful and effective in China, but whether in Japan or in the United States, when uh, such an officer uh, comes to attend this kind of conference, they will be more quiet, don't speak that strongly, and with that, it is more convincing and quite effective. So to me, as far as I'm concerned, I had rather a negative impression uh, about the way you spoke. And now I'd like to turn to your question about China. Uh, please wait. The rule of law, especially for a Communist Party, what is their view on rule of law? In Hong Kong, Hong Kong authority and Beijing states that they are following the law. And in the case of Uyghur, they also state uh, they abide by the law. But as you know, according to the Article 35 of Constitution of China, what is called the freedom of law and freedom of media, which are guaranteed in Japan, yet the even when there is such a provision, uh, there is a Communist Party that sits above the Constitution, and that is taken for granted and for the people of that country in internationally, in international venue, when they state that they would abide by the law, I'm somewhat concerned about uh, whether they would be uh, complying with the law, whether the rule of law is in short. So please be succinct. Two more hands there. Um, thank you. My name is Xu Wenli from Chinese Embassy, Chicago Taichung. And uh, I, I, I feel as a diplomat, I am compulsory to make some points. And the first lay is regarding the Professor Liu's uh, 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 points. I want to emphasize, as a professor, and uh, his uh, view just stands for his himself. 
doesn't stand for our government. <laughs> and I also noticed that as a moderator, when you call some professor and you call them name, but you call Professor Liu and you call it uh, China. I think Professor Liu is, uh, is our great professor and uh, he has his uh, unique personal view and uh, his view could serve as a uh, food of thought of uh, today's meaningful um, discussion. But as a serious official talk, if you want to hear the Chinese government's view, you can um, refer to our embassy. <laughs> And secondly, <laughs> secondly, regarding the um, uh, Excellency the Michael Fitzburris, and you mentioned the Professor Liu's book. His book has very popular in China, but I don't think his book could serve as a guideline of our presidency and for our foreign <laughs> policy. If, th if that is the case, I think Professor Liu will be very busy and it's very difficult to invite <laughs> Professor Liu to be here today. And also for the moderator, you mentioned about the, you want to know what kind of uh, 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 destin, uh, the human community for a uh, destiny to, uh, uh, for uh, uh, share the destiny. I want to uh, give you some clue. And for such a kind of a community, is that uh, it's a dream of the, of the future world. And this world must be um, constant peace. And also, there is a universal uh, security for every country. And also, it's a, there um, could provide some Please collective. Please make it the Okay, um, provide some collective prosper prosperity for the all countries. Also, it must be open and inclusive. And uh, lastly, but m maybe most important, it must be clean and be green. And that's the ideal world for China. And for the new model, that means as a rising power, we won't challenge any power. We want to cooperate with the all uh, countries in the world. And I remember the, this year, there's a very famous debate, a monk debate, and the, and the title is, is China a threat to the liberal international order? And also, uh, the Mr. February is the debater. And uh, yeah, and regarding that debate, and uh, unfortunately, you lost. So that means China isn't yeah, the please. threat to the international the order. Limit. Thank you. Well, we have a very uh, dis distinguished guest, uh, Mr. Wolfowitz. I don't know about distinguished, but I have a question that's really been bothering me. I feel like I'm sitting in a discussion in 1939 about <laughs> Germany's relation with the world. And nobody's uh, prepared to address seriously the fact that tens, and thousands, tens of thousands of German communists and German Jews have been put in concentration camps. Not yet for gas chambers, because those came much later, but concentration camps. And I would have a question for Colonel Liu. Is there a place for Muslims in the China dream? And for the other members of the panel, how should the rest of the world respond to the fact of these hideous camps that are taking us back to the era of Mao Zedong? Hello. There's one more hand over there. So please uh, limit your question in 30 seconds. My name is Shikata, a member of GIIA. This is Bill Blay. I think there seem to be a big differences among um, U.S. leaders like uh, Capitol Hill, White House, and business sectors. Particularly, my big concern is IT companies are rushing to UA, are rushing to China and make a joint ventures in and develop new technologies. Such technology may be against US interest. How is the US is going to prevent such a possible uh, the economic uh, technological development by Ch American companies in China? Thank you. Well, our time is limited. So I would like a five-minute expansion. And Professor Liu, please. Well, a uh, question before. Uh, was that a question from the government or from yourself? And it was so long, and so it's hard to respond.
and that person's uh, question. Well, there are various uh, races, uh, white, uh, yellow, and uh, black uh, races, and they also have their own uh, dreams. And I didn't hear a very friendly comment. And uh, I would like to respond to the French uh, uh, side. I like French pimple very much. I, I am a fan of Napoleon. And I also like De Gaulle, President De Gaulle. It is that they challenge the English-speaking peoples uh, very bravely, so that's why I like them. And uh, in the recent uh, 300 years in the world, the English-speaking peoples have uh, dominated the world, uh, UK and US, that is. And that history, I believe, must come to an end. Germany and Japan included. All the peoples who love peace have to go hand in hand, and uh, we need to uh, stand against the English-speaking peoples. That will be my reply for the questions. Thank you. Uh, Professor Nakayama, one minute, please. Well, Professor Wolfowitz talked about the what the international community can do. And uh, from the latter part of 90s to 2000s, uh, there is the duty to transcend the borders and on that extension, in other words, humanitarian intervention. But right now, the world is not going in that direction. It's going in the opposite direction. But that problem, those problems uh, still are, are seen. And uh, with more authoritarianism, it's increasing. And we have not been able to come up with a clear answer. But it is not something that should be left alone. There was the liberal international order that we touched on, and human rights and uh, uh, humanitarianism. I think we need to have a good dialogue. I'm sorry, I, I'm not uh, uh, giving a clear uh, answer. Professor Pillsbury, please. Uh, <coughs> Colonel Leo did not mention when he first came to the United States, I invited him to the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. And he made a wonderful presentation, something like today. <laughs> Very soon after, the United States defense budget went up by $5 billion. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not all. I had a party at my house for 100 reporters, and he made an even better presentation there <laughs> than he did today. Voice of America also came. This was the beginning of the question Paul Wolfowitz is raising. Can we believe Chinese spokesmen? And here, the important point is not so much Colonel Liu, it's the Chinese embassy. If you understood his comment, he's asking her, <clears throat> are you speaking for yourself or are you speaking for our government? I think the reason he does this is because the People's Liberation Army in China protects the party. That's its mission. The foreign ministry in China comes under the state council. It's in the government. It's lower, quite a bit lower than the Chinese army. So Colonel Liu is quite correct to challenge his embassy. Who are you speaking for? Imagine any other country in the world where a colonel would say to Ken Sase, who are you speaking for? I'm not even going to answer your question. So I think Colonel Liu is dream come true. Well, there was one question, uh, lady. 
uh, and uh, uh, EU's uh, engagement uh, to the affairs in this part of the world is not only welcome, but it is essential in my view. Um, well, for one thing, uh, Far East is the place where you have the heaviest concentration of uh, military arsenals. Four out of uh, seven largest uh, countries with their uh, military um, prowess are concentrated in this narrow region. Um, and uh, uh, it is the most vulnerable flashpoint uh, of the world, in my view. And uh, Europe has been always regarded by Japanese people as the reference point of uh, common sense. We really need your active engagement. And uh, just to add, I think uh, uh, United Kingdom should have paid, uh, played much more uh, positive and active role in the affairs of uh, Hong Kong. Why are they so quiet? They are the ones who concluded 1983 uh, treaty with China. So, European participation uh, is uh, really incumbent uh, to the stability of this region. That's how I think. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm president of the National Defense Academy, so maybe I should stand up and uh, speak in a loud voice too. But, uh, well, uh, I recalled uh, the Chinese conferences of two or three decades ago for the first time in a long time. And there have been many views uh, indicated. And uh, for one, we have found that in China, there are various views. We understand that uh, very well now. And uh, secondly, uh, US-China relationship uh, continues to be very difficult. That seems to be the reality. And uh, there is no clear answer right now. Uh, we need to watch and see uh, uh, the mutual positions. And the third, uh, the Japanese role is very large. I think uh, many people have expressed that. We even have seen a big banner. And uh, so uh, I, uh, sorry that uh, we have gone over our time and I thank you for your cooperation. Thank you very much. I would like to thank moderator and the panelists. We take 30-minute break. During the break, 